So, so hello everyone. You are watching Indie Three, 2014, Day Three. Today is a Wednesday, if I'm sure. I've been doing this for a while now, so I'm not really sure what day it is. I'm pretty sure it's a Wednesday today. This is our first panel. If you're here in the West Coast or somewhere else, you're up pretty early, so I really appreciate it. Um, this is our first panel today about designing role-playing games without combat, and I'm here with the folks at Paradactyl Games. That is yeah. Arvind, that is Ross, that is Rutzgarn, and I'm just going to let them go and talk about what they feel they need to talk about. And I'm going to be in the background. We're going to do this for about an hour, um, and then we're going to have... You know, a few hours later, we're not going to be half around, and then we're going to have some panels again. We're going back to back. This day is going to be very much packed. Um, so enjoy, <laughs> everyone. Uh, have a good time. All righty. Now, and, you know, the advantage of having day three of like a digital convention is that if this was an actual convention, this would be like the maximum funk zone right now. Like you would just be marinated in gamers. Oh, the thing. horror. The horror. Yeah. The horror. The pathos. I mean, you know, maybe you are actually just marinating in gamer stink, guys. But if so, that's that's on you. It's, that's that's really you have no one to blame but yourself. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, uh, yeah, let's talk about role playing games, I guess, because that's yeah, kind of... <laughs> that's what we're here yeah. for. But these yeah. <laughs> these fine people are here for. Yeah. So uh, yeah, just a general kind of thing. Me, Ross, and Ratskarn have been making. Uh, role playing games together for the better part of an year otherwise we've been making this for like i don't know like five six years or something yeah <laughs> yeah Arvind and i come from a half-life 2 mod background which is like the weirdest place to come for rpgs yeah yeah there's no like half-life 2 rpg along the lines of doom rpg is there there really isn't i, I found yeah. that kind of weird actually no there were but but uh let's say what what happened was that when they kind of started like eventually, the the sheer badness of the source tools <laughs> would get in the way of making a half decent conversation oh. system. Arvind, yeah. oh, you're right. The frankness. Oh well, then yeah, it it runs on GGUI, yeah. so it just occurred to me that that must be it. Yeah, yeah. In fact, like the GUI part of a role playing game, especially, is way more important compared to others because all of your dialogue, your inventory screens, your character screens, your the other 500 screens that are there in an RPG, all of them are kind of need a, a good GUI and VGUI. I mean, come on, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> I think that's probably enough discussion of the downsides yeah. of the source mod yeah. for this particular panel. <laughs> okay, so let's start with uh, just a general overview of what we are going to talk about. So we are going to talk about uh, designing role-playing games that are without combat, that have very little combat in them, or maybe even like no combat. So, I have an agenda list here, like a true professional, and the first point it says is the role played by combat and conversation in role-playing games. So, Ratskan, you want to start on like what role does combat and conversation play in these type of games? Yeah, yeah, I'd like to talk about that a little bit. So, uh, cards on the table, I come from a strong tabletop gaming background. I've been playing, like, tabletop Dungeons and Dragons style role-playing games since I was about seven or eight. And it's really pretty easy to see how those kinds of games and systems created the first, like, computer role-playing game. And really sort of influenced how you're going to be playing those sorts of things. Because the thing about any kind of abstract system like rolling dice or computers crunching numbers and adding stats together, is that it's very, very good for spatial simulations. For things like, if I swing this at that and it hits, how much does it hurt? You know, it's very good for sort of stuff that everybody can agree on that's unambiguous, you know, that, that sort of thing. Yeah, this is actually I, where, um, if you've ever played Joust, the arcade game, that's like the earliest one I've seen, but it's a very good example of that. Yeah, and I always play. I always role played when I played Joust. I always played myself as like an Atlantic accented uh, playboy, who's the <laughs> king awesome. of the Joust circuit. <laughs> Meh! Yeah, you'll taste my ostrich's feathers now. No, I'm sorry. Back to the actual point I was getting at, which was the thing is when you have an emphasis on combat because that's what your mechanics are good at simulating. It's only really good for certain kinds of storytelling, and with the original Dungeons and Dragons, that was heroic fantasy. Which was, I, I imagine, what the people wanted to simulate anyway. But that was sort of what they were locked into. Because when you've got lots of combats, generally speaking, unless it's a war game, you're going to assume that you're winning most of them as like the player. As the player that like you can fight eight orcs and win. And then you can go and fight a dragon and win. 
And that basically your character is running around getting into fight after fight to the death and is always winning. So, you know, ultimately that, that sort of, unless they're a hero, that's a little bit weird, right? You know, if you're thinking about, like, a guy who went around just challenging random people to knife fights, how long do you think that guy would, would last? Guys, any experience knife fighting? Unfortunately not. Like, I mean, stuff like that usually gets you wanted stars in other genres yeah. of video games. So, yeah, so it's typically... Like, yeah, sorry. Yeah, the thing is, when you've got this emphasis on, like, constant combat, like, it's sort of, it has to be that, you know, you've got a goal, and that there's a lot of combats between you and that goal, and that you're sort of, in some ways, you know, it's not always as explicit as you're destined to overcome them, but basically you're just, like, a super rad dude, or lady dude, or gender ambiguous dude, and you're just crunching through all of these battles, like, no problem. Yeah, and... If in effect, uh, to kind of provide variation to that, uh, pretty much every additional system that's added to a role playing game is added to enhance that combat further. So for example, let's say I add an inventory system so you can carry like five types of armor and swap them out. Ultimately, each types, type of that armor is only going to come into play in combat. It's not like, uh, I mean, at best you can get like plus best of plus two charisma or something, but and stuff like crafting, uh, you collect ingredients and ultimately uh, what you do is you craft better weapons for yourselves. Or yeah. You yeah. So yeah, basically every single thing comes back to the combat. Yeah. And, and that kind of makes, uh, and I guess from a tabletop background that kind of makes sense because the conversation would usually happen between the people doing the numbers. So that was, that wasn't, uh, that didn't quite need to be put into the pen and paper rules, I guess. And that's that's the other thing is that you know that so, you know with with a uh, pen paper tabletop games, you know it made sense that you know you have your combat over here and you have your social stuff over here, so all the rules are going towards combat. But even with those, like it actually took them a long time to break out of the the mindset where well, okay, playing is fun. It's just you're, you're occupying a character's sort of mind space and you're making decisions as the character would and you're seeing what the consequences of the decisions were. That's really, that's really fun and interesting. We don't need to necessarily make that about a hero who's on a quest. You know, it, it took a little bit to break out of that mindset in the mainstream, but uh, it sort of did happen. Like, you got a lot of games today, which... Like, I, I played a game recently called The Quiet Year which I think you can find with the symbol Google. And basically, it's a role-playing game where you're playing an entire community together. And, like, you're making decisions for the community. And you're also also kind of the GM at the same time. And there's no, there's no like, rolling off. There's no, like, combat mechanics. You know, it's based on a very sort of organic storytelling experience. And obviously, that would be hard to do with a computer. I I'm yeah, digressing. So it's almost happy between, like, Door Fortress and, like... Uh, God games, admire style. Yeah, and that's the problem is that since computer games don't really have the ability to have that kind of organic storytelling, often they just kind of write off anything besides like the get into a lot of different combats. Oh, by the way, thank you for linking that. Um, get into a lot of different combats, and at the end of it, there's the next story beat mode. You know, they, they don't really break out of that, and I think that's a mistake because I think that you know even if your rules are really only good for simulating combat because honestly, you know, I'm sure there is like a good system to be made for like social combats as a way of describing it where like you have uh, at, like you have unambiguous uh, non-abstracted mechanics that translate uh, into social success or failure. Yeah, but, but ultimately like there is a whole bunch of other problems, uh, you know, inherent with treating social hierarchies the same combat. way as yeah, because in combat, you can say that, okay, I hit Orc on head, Orc is now on floor, and hence I win. But yes. in social places, it's kind of usually more complicated than that. Oh, but that you can accomplish your goal in many ways. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess uh, to sort of uh, adapt to that thing, uh, coming back to computer role-playing games, what we kind of have now is usually uh, games which like which many people have called guns in conversation or like swords in conversation, where there's clearly demarcated areas. 
so there is a town and in the town you talk to people and you maybe select some dialogue options and then you go outside the town and outside the town is a place where all the talking stops and all you do is adventuring which is like you know killing people and uh, looting chests collecting ingredients etc so that that's a sort of clear demarcation between two different types of systems and rarely do these two ever interact right sort of what I'm, uh, I'm getting around to is like it's okay to do this it's okay to have like okay you know your your combat is your combat and your social stuff is your social stuff and since the rules are good for simulating combat you know where we should we should have fights and that sort of thing but i think that's good for things besides the storytelling mode it's always adapted to because you look at almost every RPG and it has the same sort of idea of you're this guy who goes around getting into fights all the time and always winning. And of course you always win. Of course you don't always win. You lose sometimes. But when you lose, generally speaking, you die. Or a party member dies and you just hit the reload button and you lose X amount of progress and you go back. And the thing is, that does create a system where ultimately in the span of a game, unless you were absolutely explicitly intended to, your character never loses a fight. And when you think about it, that makes a lot of the decisions around battle meaningless. Like, well, let's take a let's take an example where your your character walks up to a situation where there's like a thug menacing an old man, and the thug's like, "Hey, you better stay away. You don't want to get involved with this because I'm I'm the thug who will fight people to the death for no reason. So you know, you don't want any of this." <laughs> and you've got your you've got your good option, you've got your bad option. Your good option is you intervene, like you're like, no, I'm going to put my life on the line to save this fair old man. And then you've got the evil option, which is, I guess, uh, I, I don't know, I'll mug them both. Evil options in games, usually. They're usually really, really they're awful. Usually, they're really stupid, usually. <laughs> anyway, the point is, so... But really, as the good uh, choosing the good option, you didn't really feel that like a super heroic person for stepping in and saving this guy because, let's be honest, you knew you would win that fight. Like when you, when you get into the fight with that thug, your decision is: Do I want to be a hero or do I want to not be a hero? It's not: Do I want to risk my life for this guy? It's, yeah, there is Do I no want risk. to bother to help this guy? And I guess, you know, this is where probably defenders of this kind of situation would say, well, that's where the role-playing comes in. You know, you have to role-play yourself as somebody who's willing to step in. You have to sort of get into character. And that's, yeah, that's but, fine, but the mechanics yeah, but don't I encourage guess, it. Yeah, and I guess that's the only kind of role-playing available. There isn't really any kind of uh, thing where you're like, I am really risking my life. And really, like, risking your life as a digital construct, like a player character kind of thing, would be kind of... It's it's it has an inherently less value. So you're inherently less heroic when you are rescuing someone in a video game. Yeah, anyway. you're hardly risking anything in the real world. Yes. But even mechanically, you rarely risk anything important. It's not like if you die, you lose major stuff. Yeah. The I mean, closest we yeah. get to that is like Dark Souls, but there's no role playing in Dark Souls in that sense. Uh, continue. I mean, I guess XCOM is kind of like that, but then uh, like there's not really any like kind of that kind of moral choice in XCOM where you are like. But then, but yeah, XCOM is a completely different thing anyway. So yeah, I'm gonna like come back to this thing. I would actually like so, to say, well, since we brought up XCOM, you know, what I'm gonna get into is that you can create systems which, yeah, you know, it is entirely possible. There are many possibilities in creating systems which punish failure without just being super frustrating or arbitrary. XCOM is definitely an example of a game where you can lose a fight and not lose the game, but it still hurts. And like, you know, when I'm playing XCOM and like there's a terror mission that's like it's five stars, that they, they've already accomplished what I was talking about. I don't go into that terror mission like, oh, you know, it's, I'm gonna save the day all in a day's work, citizen. I'm like, oh, God, no. Uh, I'm probably gonna lose from one of my guys again. Maybe all of them. Maybe there's chrysalids. Ah, yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll do it. Yeah. I need to save those people. Yeah, actually, yeah. that led to a really so, funny. Um, hmm. of which I 
Go ahead, yeah. No, okay. Yeah. There's so, a moment okay. I re always remember from playing original XCOM where I had this same problem. I had a, well, I knew a chrysalid was in a building, which is, if you don't know, an enemy that is incredibly fast will kill people and turn them into zombies, which themselves will kill people and turn them into zombies. It's basically can a zombie horde. And all my guys are outside, and in any other tactical game, I would have walked up to the door, opened it, and been like, there it is, shoot it. In this case... My strategy was to stand outside with a line of 10 guys and just shoot the building until nothing was left because there was one enemy in there that was so scary, I didn't want to lose anybody, that I had to do that for like 15 turns straight. Yeah. It was just a firing line of troops. Yeah. Yeah. So, so anyway, uh, like what we were kind of uh, going towards in that is that uh, system. Games. But ultimately, like uh, combat heavy RPGs have a general uh, tendency to be of the same type as in uh, where the protagonist is kind of uh, trapezing through a world and they don't stay for in one place for too long and they just kind of uh, if there's sort of a wave of happiness following them as in they come into one place they're like okay villagers give me the list of all your problems and I'll hit all those problems with a sword and then I will move on to village number two. And that's yeah. just like... So, uh, plots like these, like if you plot, uh, because mo uh, a lot of us also play role playing games for the plot and like for the character interactions and stuff like that. So if you have to have a plot where actions like these make sense, so that's a very limited, uh, that's a very limited structure to be have basing a plot in. Yeah. And we took one approach, which I think uh, is, you know, it, it's very situational, and I'm not saying all games should do this. For one thing, I'm not actually saying there's anything wrong with heroic narratives, by the way. Like, and there's nothing wrong with, like, a Dragon Age game where you show up to a town, you know, you ask everybody what's going on, and you get into a thousand fights, and at the end, you, well, okay, there's something wrong with, like, the amount of fights in Dragon Age, because that was just a piece Oh my play. god. But yeah, the idea is fine. That's okay. But I think that there's, there's space to explore other options. And what our game, Unrest, uh, which you can find on our website. Uh, Arvin, do you want to give them the pitch for... Well, you want to give them like the, the, uh, yeah. <laughs> the rundown, so, the sales so, pitch? Yeah, so we'll, uh, we'll actually get to the part where we are like, you know, shamelessly promoting ourselves a bit later. Yes. So let's, uh, so let's like, try to see, uh, which is actually the next, next point on my list, is how would you design a conversation system that has roughly the same depth of a typical combat system. Uh, I mean, and when you say con like designing a conversation system, that's a whole lot of design problems. Because what you got is, uh, for example, uh, to just give you an idea of the history, uh, designers from all over the world have been trying to refine combat mechanics for the better part of like the last decade or so, or the cent or even say like. I don't know how long, but well, but there's been a lot of work put into combat mechanics to get to the point where we are now, and stuff which we consider standard in a combat role-playing game. Well, uh, but yeah. uh, I, I think we need to sort of establish immediately, like w when we say like creating a conversation system, what our goal is, because if we're designing like a combat system, the point of a combat system is to win. So if you've got a social system which is designed like a combat system, you're getting in every conversation to win. So yeah, really, that's, that that's kind what I was of game earlier. would probably be one where you're playing like a sociopath. Where you're playing like a con artist or somebody, like a, yeah, an, an much, Adam yeah. Jensen type. A spy, who's getting into every conversation to beat the other person. Yeah. And, like if you're like a lawyer or a debater, like, you know, somebody uh, mentioned Phoenix Wright in the comments. I think that's a pretty accurate example. But, yeah. you know, in like a in a lot of games, like this would really not be an ideal system. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so so basically, if, if your goal is to uh, kind of, you know, simulate interactions between people, as in conversations normal people might have. Uh, need a win or a loss situation. It needs the player to be able to define the, their win and loss uh, conditions by themselves. Yes. So, so for example, uh, let's let's take a very basic system where uh, 
an npc can only have two states either they are happy with you or they are sad with you i e the mass effect uh, system but but i digress so 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 for that conversation system uh, the player will need to set their own goals as in uh, do i want this character to be happy with me or do i want this character to be angry at me so yeah for uh, yeah anyone okay did you lose your train of thought or yeah, oh, no, i was uh, no i kind of i thought i disconnected uh, okay oh no we're anyway. still here oh right so so anyway yeah now, now this kind of segues into what uh, like stuff which i have researched or kind of done before so uh, like i am a huge fan of uh, modeling tones in a in a system because that is one of the things which we kind of uh, can hopefully uh, hope to quantify as in uh, when i'm saying something i'm not just repeating something in a like monotone voice i'm kind of uh attaching a tone with it so like i can be super sarcastic or i can be happy or i can be sincere or i can just be like sad so there's a lot of tones involved so that was one thing which we kind of uh did a whole bunch of play tests and stuff upon mm-hmm. it's something yes. modern games try to accomplish with body language and stuff as well it to varying amount of success. <laughs> I yeah. remember I remember the, the, the dishonored success with body language as a form of communication. Okay, everybody everybody who's watching this, do the dishonored with me. Put your arms folded in front of your chest with your right hand on your left elbow, and then occasionally raise up your right <laughs> hand <laughs> at a at an angle away from you, like you're doing I'm a little teapot, and then put yeah. it back down. You've like got a, all the body language in that entire multi million dollar video game. I know, and it's it's <laughs> like the the emotion cap that that yeah. motion, just that motion, <laughs> and they think, Yes, I have created emotion in a video game. <laughs> yeah. Look at all these polygons. Yeah. Oh god. So, yeah, actually the comment system uh that like the comments have a really great point in that uh basing a conversation system around navigating a dialogue tree is is really inherently kind of uh weird, I guess, and and sort of problematic because that means you kind of approach people as vending machines. Yes. Where you are like, okay, what do I want from this person? And what what buttons do I push to get that? Instead of uh this is the kill all humans topic. I shouldn't go too far down that one. <laughs> yeah. I I um that's actually one of the things, you know, I, I know we're going to talk about unrest later, but this is one of the things that I I definitely wanted when I was designing the game is because I want the conversations to feel like there's something you can take seriously and I want the characters to feel like somebody you can take seriously. So yeah. every conversation in unrest does not use like doesn't use the tree system. It uses the like it, 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 it's the flowchart system where, like, it's just you guys are having a conversation. They'll say something, you'll have three responses to that, that'll lead to a response from them, you'll have three other responses. Like, yeah. everything is when you're talking to, like, a Mass Effect NPC. Yeah, and, and, and like, you're asking about their, their life's history or whatever. Like, after you've gotten past the weird tree part. Yeah, and I guess uh, to kind of compare and contrast a typical dialogue tree system with that is that... Uh, like these the like the the system which we are kind of using is is inherently difficult it requires more work so we kind of understand why it's been done the other way especially but, with voice acting we use text and when it, with yeah. text like tone an actual indicator of tone is a lot more important because we don't have like the fancy mocap body language to really take advantage of yeah so yeah. it's much easier for people to read sarcasm or something else into text that may or may not be there yeah and i guess uh ultimately like the whole kind of structure thing as in uh, a, a structure of a combat based game uh, that ultimately means you spend uh, relatively little time like talking to people just just uh, talking to people without any particular aim like not to like not to increase their friendship meter or not to get a quest item or not to get a quest or something like that so for that uh, npc personalities and such are also they kind of need to be in your face to because you're only going to spend 10 minutes with them so yes. they got to use that 10 minutes to give you the whole kind of their whole uh, 
Uh, dossier. To sell the plot beat. Yeah, it's gotta be hard to have, it's gonna, it's gonna be hard to have an NPC who is subtle about things. It's possible, but they basically need to be around a lot. Or, like, it needs to be the sort of thing where you only realize that they were playing you later. Because, like, you know, it, it sort of has to be that an NPC comes out, and in the five lines that they exchange with you, they sort of outline their entire thesis of who they are. You know, a good writer will do that so that they're it's it's they're not like just telling you explicitly like a Bethesda fashion. I'm angry about this. You know, I I don't like you very much. I don't like those elves. You know, it, it it'll it'll just come through in what they're saying to you. Like you know, oh by the way, if you, if any of those stupid elves stop you, you know, just punch them in the face. Yeah. So I guess. Um... And and NPCs like these, in turn, uh, kind of, uh, I guess, limit the depth of your plot. Your plot has to be about broad strokes, as in like fate of the galaxy or fate of this continent or fate of the world kind of stuff. Because when you have these NPCs who are kind of like cardboard cutouts of real people who somehow feel like that, then you can't really have a plot that's, let's say, uh, just about uh, what happens in a single hour. Like, for example, an argument that you have in a coffee shop, coffee shop somewhere, then it can't be about that because you because you have uh, a, a conversation system that's basically built around uh, a single uh, variable like friendship. As in, if you if the friendship is zero, you kind of the person hates you or you like, and you get max renegade points. And if the friendship meter is hundred, they like you and they you know. Uh, they give you end game benefits usually. Yeah, yeah. So, so I guess the the kind of po labored point which we have been making for the past I don't know how long is is that uh, when you are uh, when you opt for this kind of conversation system, you inherently limit uh, what you can do with it. Yeah. And and role playing games are are all about using one or more systems so for example uh, in any role playing game that you have you have designers talking about the pillars that they have you know uh, so like the pillars can be crafting or they can be exploration or they can be combat and like loot and econ economy like uh, you know stuff uh, stuff or like that like so grand theft auto 4 and it's apparently a live world that no one cared to examine for much <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that yeah. Really was, that really was going to be yeah. one though uh, I mean I guess that really like I don't think Grand Theft Auto really has any designs to be a role playing game no no so, I, but like, yeah. I guess Bethesda would be a better example but it, like simulating a world isn't really exploration but there's like actually a pillar now sort of showing up in games where they just want to make a world where you don't even interact with it and it just has stuff going on of its own accord sort of the, the, the parts of the Caribbean approach I'm referring to yeah. the ride here not the yeah. <laughs> diminishing returns franchise <laughs> Huh. So, so yeah. When you have all of these pillars, uh, so what you actually have is a is a, a big pillar that's called combat, and all of these little pillars that are supporting it. So that inherently makes you neglect the conversation stuff because, uh, and this is another thing actually, which uh, as developers, like we kind of know, is that uh, when you say spend three months on a feature, for example, if we spend three months polishing combat then that combat has to justify its presence you yes. can't just have uh, like a single combat uh, encounter so for example uh, let's say we want to uh, simulate uh, or, or not not simulate let's say if we want to make a role-playing game about a normal city person who's living in for example I don't know Vancouver or something so so then uh, I I would wager that they don't really face combat scenarios much in their day-to-day -day lives. I've been to Vancouver. I don't know about that. <laughs> okay, yeah, maybe. Okay, some other city. All right, just just imagine your city, right? So, <laughs> so, the, so when you but so for a game like that, uh, spending three months in combat, for example, out of a like any year of development, makes that combat uh, feel either incredibly wasteful or you would find ways to so, so I guess what we wait did did I okay yeah so no. yeah so when you so games like that inherently limit what can be discussed in a 
in a role playing game and role playing games are great for uh, simulating how lots of systems interact with each other i mean taking to it taken to its extreme example i mean even dwarf fortress is a role playing game so okay it, it is almost like a naturally seeded role playing game where everything is sort of determined by such complex systems that it doesn't actually work okay this is sort of where like my tabletop pedigree leads me to disagree like i i actually don't think of a role playing game as a factor of systems at all i i i tend to think of it just mostly as one in which there is in some way a persona where inhabiting that persona is a large part of why you play the game. And I recognize that the video game definition is usually different, but I, I wonder how much that could change with the no, that's titles. A, that's actually a fair point. That makes Dwarf Fortress a strategy or sim game, which it kind of is. Yeah, I, I, I would definitely call Dwarf Fortress a, a, simulate, a sim game. You know, honestly, like, g genre is not a... Genre should not be... No, a, not at all. Yeah, like, yeah should we shouldn't like, kind of limit... Yeah, shouldn't kind yeah. of limit ourselves to... But these words exist only to make talking about the games convenient. That's the only reason these genre words exist. They are noises we have to make this conversation easier to have. And the moment they make the conversation more difficult to have, we should probably move on to something more important. Like playing video games! <laughs> yeah. So, so anyway, uh, Ratskan, like, uh, you, have, uh, you were talking about writing on like, role-playing games. Yes. So absolutely. So so how is uh, tell me like how would writing a combat based game uh, make you vary your approach compared to writing a, a game that's primarily about conversation? Well, I think in both cases, uh, when you've got the combat based game and when you've got the social based game, you know it depends on what exactly you're trying to accomplish with either part. Like I've said, most of the time, the point of having lots of combat in a role-playing game is to create the sense that it is a heroic narrative. That there are many obstacles standing in the way of you, the hero, but you will overcome them because you are better than other people. You will reach some kind of end goal, or in the case of certain franchises that shall remain unnamed, not reach them in a catastrophic fashion. And you will, in some way, get what you wanted. The combat exists partially like as fun, but in a higher gameplay sense, as a way to reinforce the idea that this is not an easy quest and that you're overcoming many obstacles. So the conversations in that kind of game, if I was going to write them, I think would probably be ones that emphasize like, you know, what the world is that you like what the stakes are, you know, that that sort of thing. Like what is it exactly that makes you different from other people and it makes you want to walk this road what is it that keeps you going yeah because all that stuff is the context which makes the combat meaningful which makes it important i would also say what you stand to lose if you fail but that's yeah, actually something yeah. I, I don't see too often uh, like you said yeah failure is an illusion in most of these games but you know the illusion needs to exist yeah it is it's just that like most often the Saving the world narratives tend to almost forget the world that you're saving. Because a world that only has like five characters you care about, you only want to save those five characters. You don't actually care about the fictional world that isn't going to destroy itself if you fail. Yeah, this is definitely a place for games like Dragon Age Origins, you know, who have got all this, you know, all these writers, you know, and got all this this money and this funding. You know, for all the strengths of Dragon Age Origins, and I, I did really like the game, I don't think it sold me on wanting to stop the Darkspawn very well. Like, I, you know, I, of course, it, it's better to stop the Darkspawn than not stop them, but there wasn't a whole lot of stakes that I felt like I really cared about that weighed on how well or poorly I conducted myself. And that was actually, it was kind of interesting, because that game actually took a lot of chances in allowing you to have, like, victories that were incomplete, or to have, like, victories that, like, caught, had sacrifices and that cost you things, uh, or that, you know, be able to have complete victories, even. And having that gradient of responses should have made it like you know much should have made you much more involved because you knew that you could fail in a sense. But uh, yeah. I, I guess I never felt really like I, I had that kind of state because I never really like you know with the exception of a few characters, I don't feel like anybody really felt to me like a person that I cared about or wanted to protect. Yeah. I think uh, in the context of like that game, Dragon Age Origins in particular, I think a major problem is that. Uh, for the most part, like Darkspawn are, aren't basically outlined as villains. They basically exist to supply you with a constant stream of enemies to fight. That's a huge I mean, issue. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, when you don't have a an antagonist who 
I mean, there's a there's a argument to be made about keeping the antagonist's motivations secret. Uh, yeah. But there's but then you can but kind of hide kind of too to much. Exist. Well, here's the yeah. problem: is that in an if you're writing a good antagonist from a writing perspective, if you're writing an antagonist who you know really makes sense and a good character and is captivating, the player will remember. They, for reasons besides, they look really badass or they're really annoying to fight. Oh dear God! Then you thief. Then you know you need to make them. You need to give them a motivation that is in some way sympathetic. And the problem with having a motivation that's sympathetic is it needs to be a motivation that, like, all of their hordes of flunkies are willing to die for. And if that motivation is well written, there's always a chance that the player is going to go, well, actually, you know, does that make sense? I, I mean, that, that's, yeah. that's one thing we get around in our game because there really isn't a right or wrong answer, but, you know, it's. You know, it, it, it's it's hard in a lot of games if you're like, well, actually, yeah. I don't know why I'm getting in all these fights to depose this guy when he's really got some good points. <laughs> I usually tend to yeah. prefer that, uh, even when I'm siding with the villain. I think the only yeah. time I, I get angry when it, is when the villain's strategy makes a million times more sense than whatever I'm following, and I'm just fighting them because he's the villain, he's got to die. Yeah. I think uh, a, a good game that's, that's kind of in, a, like... A major favorite for all of us is Fallout New Vegas in that it, it allows us to basically play the villain if we want to. Yeah, and let's be honest here. I will fight anybody who disagrees with me in this. Kaisar is a villain. He's like, a villain. The Legion <laughs> is... Like, the, yeah. there's no moral ambiguity to this. Like, what the Legion yeah. is doing is objectively worse than what the NCR yeah. is doing. It's yeah. just... It's a successful society. It is in no way a good society. But yeah. you know, you know, if 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 you're willing to subscribe to that, mm -hmm. you know, philosophy, and if you know you're male, because I don't know why the f why would you support the Legion as a female character? But I digress. You know, it, it's mm -hmm. it's easy to get yourself into a mindset where you can feel mm -hmm. like this is somebody I'd fight for. Quite the yeah, fact and I mean, yeah, I guess like overarchingly, like I would actually consider the Lone Wolf ending to be the Willer ending because in in the, all of the other three endings, you're just kind of following somebody else's orders. So you are that those three are kind of you being a lackey of somebody else, but but the lone wolf ending that's you being the villain that's you arriving in this world and basically saying you know what yeah I, this is mine and I'm going to wreck this place because I'm a role playing game protagonist and I have the power kind of thing. Yes. Uh, I and think you, I should you want to run Vegas. I think I should get around to the second half of your question, which is uh, how would I do it for like a social based game rather than a combat based game. Okay, yeah. So for so what so anyway, yeah, this is just a complete ninety degree digression. So so when making a social based game and for example in our games, uh in our game unrest, uh we try to uh, model uh situations that happen el in real life, you know? And like guaranteed not all situations that are in unrest happen in real life, but a lot of them do. And the idea was to uh to start with the question, okay, what if we didn't need combat and uh, what if uh, we have this situation and we want to give the player the choice to react to this and act in a way which they would want to and which we could realistically implement. So in that scenario, uh, it, was, it was weird how completely like it changed our game making process because instead of suddenly uh, designing levels to be to be kind of uh, delivery methods for new enemies for you we kind of uh, design levels as a coherent kind of city i guess and yeah so there is a lot of things which just kind of change completely and i mean ross is, would kind of know he kind of scripted all of that stuff so oh yes <laughs> there are so yeah. many nodes that it's just like this guy says one thing, or he could say 15 other things, depending on three variables. Yeah, by like the standards of calculating game endings, we've got like, for press releases, we've got 360 endings. What that really means is that we've got like 10 different endings contingent on one set of choices. Uh, sorry, no, we've got 36 different endings contingent on one set of choices, and then that's modified by like five different endings for another part of the game, and then like two different endings for another part of the game. Yeah, but even some of the conversations where rather than just being two or three combinations of things someone could say, it was like a whole new line or two dialogue for each combination of variables, which is pretty cool.
Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the thing is that you know if you're going to make a game based around choices, it helps to have the player. You know, sort of th- those choices matter to the player. Um, there, I was sort of. Uh, if you're making like a social based game, though, the main thing is that you do need to find those conflicts which are not physical, which are not violent, and this this really shouldn't be so hard because these kinds of conflicts arise all the time. Like, this is most of your life, guys. Like, you, most of your life is going out and, like, having questions like, oh, you know, I don't want to do the dishes, but, you know, it's my turn, but he never does his chores, so is it is it okay for me to not do it? Am I letting myself down? And, you know, that that's, that's an example without a whole lot of direct conflict, but, you know, there, there's much more examples where you're sort of, you're navigating these situations. And we're ultimately, you know, in, in a sense, you can be somewhat victorious or somewhat not victorious. Although I think it's important with a social-based game to have victory not, like, be always hanging like a carrot. Like, one, one of yeah, my pet because... peeves... Go ahead, go ahead. No, go ahead. Okay, one of the things that sort of annoys me the most in RPGs is, like, the romances. Because almost always the romances are a matter of, like, I say a thing and then... Like, they, the, the NPC says a thing, and then do I say a, a happy, sympathetic thing that they like? Or do I then, like, just say, eh, I don't really care? Or, you know, no, you are a bad person for doing that. And they're like, well, no, I'm not a bad person. You're a bad person. Romance quest failed. Like, that's that's almost all the time that's what it is. I I, yeah. I would be much more interested in a game where, like, you know, the romance was based around just having conversations throughout the game. Like, not like, I'm talking to you in camp, we are having the interview for the romance process, <laughs> but like, you know, talking about whether or not you want to get something, like, you know, what, what approach you want to take in, like, getting this done, or, like, what you think of what just happened. And gradually, you know, you would either be weeded out as a possibility, or, you know, you would they would start to become interested and then once you're in the relationship, it's okay to have a relationship that can fail. Like, this is actually a game where, where Baldur's Gate 2 got it really right, is, you know, it's not like a bunch of stuff, like flirtation, leading up to, we are an item now, and we have sex. Like, it, it was more like, you know, a little bit of flirtation, we're in a relationship now, and now the question is, does it work out or not? And that's what the rest of the conversations were it's designed actually a, to. A problem many RPGs have. It's not just uh, relationships. It's it's any interpersonal relationships between characters, especially non-player ones, tend to be cut off completely from the main plot. They don't seem to develop naturally as you go on, unless it's a very scripted narrative. Uh, yeah. And in fact, uh, apart from that, uh, even uh, attribute checks are kind of weird because they sort of divide uh, you into. Uh, like they divide you into either you have it or you don't have it as in you either have seven intelligence or you don't so like that never really feels completely natural though I mean I guess it's good for when you you know like are filling in your character sheets and stuff it kind of feels nice to you know min max and stuff like that but doesn't really make a whole lot of sense because I mean when you have stuff that's like which is basically you going down a checklist and uh, because uh, hello it, it, yeah, it's we, like a fine, simulated yeah. uh... I kind of lost my train of thought but anyway yeah <laughs> what I was saying was that uh, for example uh, if you are having a key conversation let's say at the top of a mountain you know uh, cl- climactic uh, conversation that was uh, between you and the villain uh, most uh, most of the time these are kind of handled as uh like the like there's a handful of options which are like an easily uh categorized thing where it's like antagonize the person or say they are kind of right or just deliver your badass one liner kind of thing so the stuff like the, that is no go uh, ahead. there's usually the slam dunk of like you have 15 intelligence are you witty enough to say the thing that wins you the conversation immediately <laughs> yeah <laughs> So anyway, yeah, uh, the the yeah tying uh, like conversation options to uh, certain uh, you know attributes that you have is kind of it's it's kind of like I don't like that approach because it's no. kind of yeah. 
I typically notice um, when you have that as well. It, they seem to give like to think, oh well, you have these stats, you get to say this one thing, your character gets to be smart here, and the conversation's over. And then the the alternative sometimes, and this drives me nuts, is an actually intelligent line of thought, like where you dissect what the person's philosophy is, and that's like. That's the option for if you fail. If you're not smart enough, then you get to do these things. But if you're smart enough, you can take a shortcut by just clicking on the intelligence bracketed response. Yeah, I think I think it's not really necessary to have like attributes governing your responses too much in a role playing game. Because like yeah, yeah, again, you know, the problem in a tabletop system is that you can have a really smart character who. You know, if if you're not, or like you could have a really sociable, charming character, and as like the player. You know, you can't always think of something smart and charming and sociable to say. But, you know, as long as you've got a writer who can kind of sit there in front of his computer for 20 minutes and come up with something really smart to say, you know, it's pretty easy to provide those options to players without gating them off yeah. as checks. Yeah. And I mean, uh, there's a good uh, question in the chat where uh, somebody is asking if the Telltale, uh, recent Telltale games like The Walking Dead, etc. could be considered RPGs. I, I mean, that's I really weird that they aren't, to be honest. Because when I play uh, them, that's that's exactly what it makes me think of, is a tabletop RPG experience. Yeah. I mean, I guess it, this is more of a case of... Because really, like, the reason Telltale ha have, like, checkmarked them in the adventure genre is because, like, they are an established thing. It's more from a commercial standpoint, right. as opposed to, uh, you know, a design kind of standpoint. Yeah, and I think... I think Telltale is very good at not worrying too much about what genre their game is, just making the game they want to make. And yeah. I don't think it's too much of a stretch to say in designing Unrest, like we're, our game is, in principle, pretty similar. Like we, we we sort of play a little more with like how choices affect things, because it's kind of like instead of designing five chapters, you know, that we designed one game of five chapters, which kind of play off each other a lot more. The chapters are more like a oh I wanted to say a sandbox, but they're they react a lot more to what you've done in previous chapters. They're just kind yeah. of like this stuff is happening here, but then all this is contingent on what happened before. And to be fair, we don't have to worry about like three D assets or voice acting. Yeah, animations, so that, that's, voice acting. Yeah, so that that's very easy for us to do. But well, I mean, it's not mm. easy. But in fact, it wasn't easy at all. But we did it. it was it's possible it, it, for yeah, us to do. It's the strength of the text medium. It's why like yeah. we can just come to a weekly meeting and be like, oh well, you know, we could add like three times as much more text to this quest to explain why these people are here. And we go, yeah, why not? Let's do it. It'll just take an afternoon. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's the sort of thing where without having voice acting, this is actually a big deal. So I'm glad we got to this. Is if you're making a social based game and you don't have have deep deep pockets really consider not using voice acting because you know this this allows us <laughs> yeah. to tweak everything and to add new conversations right up to the wire and that's that that's something that i think really helps our game yeah, yeah they're they're cheaper they're faster and you can have so many more of them yeah and so many more permutations because you know it's it's like you know a lot of dialogues have like 50 nodes like 40 30 20 you know like it's like yeah. we're these are just like in, in practice they'll feel like brief conversations but it's actually that there's just a lot of different options that players won't see on their first try yeah and I mean uh, you know when you talk about uh, the ease of content production that's actually uh, a thing which happened in most games which are kind of known for their uh, open ended endedness for example in Deus Ex I kind of remember reading an article that was uh, like one of the designers would just do design levels using lunch in lunchtime. Oh, I miss those days where to design a hallway or something. Where did Arvin go? Oh, okay. Uh, I think Arvin just kind of. <laughs> I think he just disconnected for a little bit. Oh, oh Arvin has torch. been eliminated. Oh, oh, there he is. Okay. I think he's oh, back. dang it. Yeah, he's been yeah, disconnected. Sorry. Yeah. Back in the day, that's cool. 3D level design. Um, it used to be to make a hallway, to make like a room in your level, all you had to do was drag out a box and then put the texture on the wall and you were done. And it was easy to make these areas that were fairly sprawling, sometimes too big, often too big, but that they resembled real places. So you could walk into the kitchen and it was like, here's all the food. And all it took to make that food was the level designer to drag out a you know vaguely pear-shaped box and put a green texture on it. So making content was much easier. Whereas now, yeah. you need you need someone to yeah. model it and 3D uh, 
normal map it and someone to place it and someone to do the lighting in the room and it yeah, it's I mean, so you much can effort. You see these discrepancies in the 3D era. Compare the quantity of clutter in Morrowind to the quantity of clutter in Skyrim. They had two different entries in the Elder Scrolls franchise separated by what, like 10 years? And in Morrowind, yeah. you've got like eight different kinds of plate. You know, you've got like all hmm. kinds of stuff that's good for nothing. Like literally useless, like worthless, just weighs a little bit in your inventory, you know, doesn't do anything, but it's just, it, it looks good. It, it adds color and variance. And some of it's like even only found in like one town or like only found in like one dungeon. And like they'll just create stuff for jokes. And in Skyrim, it's like, you know, everything has like, there's like, I think like four kinds of plate, you know, kinds of bowl. Doesn't really have as yeah. much. Sort yeah, of depth. not as much character. The uh, yeah. because the the time investment in making those assets is so much more now. Yeah. Mm. Uh, yeah. Actually, half or Booty Mancer had a question where would something like Harvest Moon or Animal Crossing be considered a pseudo RPG that lacks combat? So I mean, I guess with games like these, it's kind of like how much do you have in your head versus how much do you have it spelled out to you in stat tables and stuff. Yeah, I wouldn't so, really call them. I wouldn't say that they don't fit within my mental model of an RPG too well, but... Yeah, but again, I mean, like, if you want to roleplay in that game, I mean, I'm, like, I don't think there's anything that says you can't. So, I mean, yes. I, I'm pretty cool with, like, calling them roleplaying games, because ultimately, uh, roleplaying is in your head, kind of. Yeah, yeah. so I, I really just think of a roleplaying game as a game where the systems encourage you to get inside a player's head, like a character's head. The systems encourage you to make decisions as somebody who is not yourself. Uh, where like yeah. they make that kind of gameplay rewarding. So, for example, Counter Strike does not make that kind of gameplay rewarding. No. Uh, you know, <laughs> Half Life Two doesn't make that kind of gameplay rewarding. Skyrim yeah. is actually kind of a borderline case where it's uh, like you I can would make actually, macro uh, decisions, <laughs> like you yeah. can join factions. Like, you can join yeah. different factions, but you, you don't actually get too many choices to find who you are. And often, choices that you really want are just frustratingly absent. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, w I actually consider uh, Football Manager. It's a game that's kind of like, it's about managing a football team to, one of, to be one of the best RPGs ever. Because, <laughs> I mean, there are a, there's a whole conversation system in there. And, like, everyone has their own uh, morale and... And you have to navigate this cutthroat world of football management, etc. So yeah, I mean, really, like, there's no, there's no law that says you can't uh, role play as a football manager in that. Yeah, I think it also comes back to whether or not you're making a character of your own creation from scratch. Uh, a game design like that, so that would definitely be Skyrim, where you make a puppet and you just kind of impose whatever character you want onto them, and the game just kind of takes it as like a you know, in the general sense, will sort of react to them, but isn't scripted around it. Versus a game like, I guess JRPGs are famous this, or The Witcher, where you are Geralt, and you can play different aspects of Geralt, but you can't really just decide, well, now I'm going to be a peace-loving, you know, druid or something like that. You, you have to be The Witcher. Your decisions are all sort of colored by that. Yeah, uh, hello, but you still have those I just, uh, oh, right, uh, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, because yeah, we have about five minutes left. Um, actually, and Arvin actually just connected... I'm going to put him in right now. There he is. He's back. Um, so, uh, yeah, we have about five minutes left. If there's any particular thing you want to note, really important, you should let me know. You should say it. Um, also, um, I mean, I know that you've already been answering questions in the chat, but if you're in the chat and you have questions, you should probably note those questions very soon because we're about to end. So any closing comments, any uh, questions in the chat that you want to uh, answer, so uh, you should do that very soon. Okay. Uh, while we're waiting for the chats to come in, uh, Arvin, do you yeah. want to just pitch on rest real quick and give a link? Oh, oh right. Um, yeah, I'm completely off my game today. So, <laughs> so, so anyway, cool. yeah. I, I could put it, I could put a link in the chat if, if you have a if you have that, a link. That I actually can use. be great. Yeah. Uh, short version okay. is it's a it's the only uh, it, it's a social based role playing game where you make decisions and those decisions matter. You play a lot of different mundane characters rather than one big heroic character, and it's probably the only computer role playing game ever made where there's no white people. <laughs> if, if that's a selling point. <laughs> Uh, no, uh, yeah, and I would add that uh, Unrest is about uh, navigating social systems. So, for example, uh, the game deals with caste, which is kind of a big thing, like, or w was an even bigger thing in India, you know. Yeah. So, so the game is about navigating that as a, as like, sometimes you're on the 
on the high end of the kind of thing and you benefit from the caste system and sometimes you're on the low end and you kind of uh, and the caste system actively harms you so the game is about examining what systems like that do and it's about uh, you as a character making the decision that's uh, best for yourself okay. um, and there's no real uh, kind of change the world like at the end of unrest you would you won't change the world of the setting that's in but you might have made the world slightly better for yourself or for your family or for your friend okay. or like so we should probably yeah. get around to some questions real quick because we've, we've just gotten yeah. a bunch but um uh so uh bj asked does the definition of role playing pretty much come down to the rules a player imposes on themselves uh i wouldn't say i, I would say that that that's getting there i think uh it's more about it's it's less about self-imposed rules and more about self-imposed guidelines, but uh, I guess it's that's a pedantic negative. Very much the first category of what I said, where if you have your own character and you impose rules on them to roleplay, that's one style of roleplaying, whereas the other one is you are an actor playing out the role of the character that the designers have already laid out for you. Okay, um, Jason yes. RN asked, I'm just going to summarize the question here, um, if you mute the audio and just read the chat text system, would that be like a, a non-combat role-playing uh, game? I think that the key element of like a non-combat mm -hmm. role-playing game is just that like you're you're making decisions about your character that is more important than like just fighting. I think um I I, I think that like having audio or not having audio like in in combat systems uh, is isn't super important, especially with their text system versus uh, voice acting. Yeah. Uh, let's see. I think somebody else asked a question. I'm just trying to lock it down here. Um, oh, yes. How do you tackle the difficulties of using silence as a conversation option? Um, generally speaking, silence is, should be best utilized when people besides the main character are talking, which should happen more, by the way. Uh, we didn't really have the... Like, we didn't technically have the... Like, we didn't have the technical chops to pull that off too much in our game. Not just uh, pull too much. It, it should really happen more that, like, you're, you're sort of sitting ringside. It does happen a few times, like the council scene. Yeah, well, there is a really neat scene of, uh, in the game. I'm not just pull too much, but where you are threatening a character, and the, the longer you stay silent, the more afraid of you they are, which I found very, very cool. Yeah, yeah, that, that definitely happens. The main, the main usage of silence in a role-playing game should always be to... It just left, I'll just finish up this this line. Should always be to signify that you are not participating, which is a choice in as much in, in and of itself. Oops. Yeah, I'm back. By the way, <laughs> this oh, hey, 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 doesn't hey, die. Yeah. Um. Any any last comment? Any last question? I mean. Uh, yeah. Before we, we got time for one more. Yeah, we got, got time for one more question. If anyone has a, if anyone has any particular they, they want to ask about. Um. I'm very happy about the prospect of an RPG without any white people. That's a really nice thing. So, <laughs> <laughs> this is good stuff. Yeah. It's, it's about time. So. Uh, it's also, uh, I also want to point out that uh, the, the characters that you play as, the preset characters, are like half middle aged, uh, half of them are women. And they're, you know, just we, we try to represent like more than just the standard 30 year old stubbled white dude. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was kind of, yeah, that was one thing which, yeah, like, you know, the, the 20 something attractive person that's usually. In every single video game. There's a, okay. He, yep. uh, also, know that he has a very, very grunt voice, and he has a dark past. And he, and <laughs> what, he knows yeah. the dark past we, very we, often. We do <laughs> have one like middle-aged, like mercenary captain dude. Who, if you, if you'd like, you can absolutely imagine a gravelly voice. I give you my blessing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. And um, a fantastic yeah. mustache. Yeah, great mustache. Um. So, I mean, I, I, th I think that that concludes this panel. Um. Thank you yeah. all for coming. Thank you very no much. Problem. That was, thanks, that was thanks a, very that was, much for inviting us. That was a really interesting and insightful listen for me, and probably for anyone in the chat as well. Um, and that, that's that's basically our good for now. So basically, what we're doing is that um, we don't have another panel for the next hour, but we are going to come back and we're going to start doing tons of back-to-back -back stuff um, at around 5 um, p.m. EST and 2 p.m. Pacific time. So and then and then we are. I'm looking at it. We have like five to six panels just back to back, and one of them is a stream of RPG Maker games. So if you want to check that out, make sure you do. If you want to sort of reply anything that you've listened to and you want to actually think about some games and while watching some games, that's also something recommended. Um, and and we'll be good for that. So um, thanks you all for watching. Um, thank you all for coming, of course. Um, and you are watching Indie 3 2014. Uh, we'll be right back. Wow.